So good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you here today. Um, and unfortunately, Minister Birmingham uh, could not join us. However, I'd like to acknowledge the Honourable Craig Laundie, Assistant Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science, and Professor Deep Saini, Vice Chancellor and President of the University of Canberra. I would also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land <coughs> on which we are meeting, the Ngunnawal people. As a parent of three primary school children and chair of my local primary school board, the topic of our children's futures is one that is very close to my heart. There are not too many parents who look at the world around them and fail to notice the rapid pace of change. Of course, things change all the time, and change has been part of all generations, but nothing on the scale that we see today. Generations of parents have understood the value of education and skills development, but again, like the tsunami of change that is upon us, has become more critical. This is because we hear about the future of work and the much touted statistics that go with it. We hear about the jobs of the future and indeed the jobs that won't be with us for much longer. And to this end, we hear about the importance of science, the importance of computing, the importance of creativity and so on. As my eldest son said this morning when he saw the garbage truck at our doorstep, Dad, one day soon, no one will be driving that truck. I said, yes, you're probably right, but I think one day soon, there won't even be a garbage truck. So as we fret about the best way to help our young, we have invited you here this afternoon to hear about the work the STEM Education Research Centre at the University of Canberra, together with Samsung, have been doing around STEM practices in our schools. The results have been impressive and highlight in a simple but significant way some of the things we can easily do to give our young people the skills they need to deal with the challenges ahead. So to begin, I would like to invite Professor Deep Saini, Vice-Chancellor and President of the University of Canberra, to talk to us about the university's perspective and its work in the area of STEM education. Thank you, Victor, and uh, good afternoon all. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here to the UC STEM Education Showcase. Um, a special welcome to, um, uh, to the Assistant Minister Craig Laundie, uh, to our distinguished guests, um, our, our partners from Samsung. It is truly a pleasure to be here. Uh, before I go further, let me acknowledge uh, the Nunwal and Nambri people, who are the traditional custodians of Canberra, the land on which we uh, are holding this event. I pay my respect to their elders past and present, and to, of course, all indigenous people in our communities here in Australia. The University of Canberra and Samsung Electronics Australia signed an agreement in, nine, in, in 2016 to collaborate on research and development of innovative technology-driven learning programs that were aimed to improve uh, math literacy among our young uh, students in Australia. This particular program has a very specific focus on spatial awareness. So it is not about content, it's more about the technique for teaching uh, STEM. And it is led by uh, our centenary professor and director of STEM Education Research Center at University of, uh, of, of Canberra, <coughs> Professor Tom Laurie, who is with us here today. This group has uncovered some particularly interesting insights into practical methods for increasing math education results uh, and development of student-led STEM inquiry project projects in Australia. They have taken these technologies uh, beyond Australia's border and in fact this research is having a global impact. Professor Tom Laurie will speak about these results in just a few minutes, but let me just simply say that Samsung and University of Canberra are committed to using the insights that we are getting from this research to improve uh, working with the government, working with our school system and education and educators to improve the outcomes of uh, in, in STEM education for our students in Australia. It is our mission to ensure that we prepare young Australians uh, <coughs> for a future that involves of necessity uh, mastery of STEM disciplines. We are grateful that the STEM Education Research Centre has received 
generous support from our federal government through uh, the Department of Education. We have to date received over six million dollars in funding for this program, and uh, and we are grateful for that. It is also uh, when you when you look at the impact this program is having, it is a moment for us to stop and reflect about the value of government support for research. This is precisely the kind of support that. Uh, Australian researchers need to give our young people an edge in the in the highly competitive environment uh, that this 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 world has become. So, on that note, let me welcome uh, Honourable Clegg Laundry, uh, the Assistant Minister for Industry, Innovation, and Science, to come up and say a few words. Minister. Thank you, uh, Professor Dee. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I want to pass on Minister Birmingham's apologies. Uh, I don't know what he's up to. He's, I, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know what keeps him busy nowadays. Um, he's obviously in the middle of a, a very interesting few days in his life uh, and has been called away. But I'm very pleased to be with you. And I, I think it's actually a very good synergy because uh, Deep, you and your team, and, and with, the, with the support of Tess and uh, Mark and, and Samsung, also very good, are in my, head, in my electorate, their head office. So that's rather fortuitous as well, and another good reason for me to be here. Um, but Professor Thomas Lowry, Professor Robert Fitzgerald, Dr Victor Pantano, um, what you are doing on the education side of the fence, uh, and the reason that it's an honour for me to be here today is, I think you sit on the push side of the fence, whereas my department, Industry, Innovation and Science, we sit on the pull side of the fence. If we are to solve Australia's STEM problems, and we have to, we need to acknowledge that there are, yes, investments that we have to make in education and improving education, uh, and I'll get to the switch team in a minute, uh, the, the three young wonderful ladies I've had the, uh, the honour to meet before. But we also need to, as a government, work with industry to provide career pathways. That's the pool side of fence. And that's the challenge that Minister Sinodinus and I have been working through with the implementation of the National Innovation and Science Agenda, uh, along with Burmo on the education side of the fence. To, uh, to, because the two go hand in hand, and that's why I'm so thrilled to be here today. Um, let's not sugarcoat it, and we wouldn't need to do innovation and work in this space if things were going well. We need, you know, all our test results and international measures show us that we need to keep investing in that. And Deep, you and your team, working in conjunction with Samsung and the federal government, are absolutely at the coalface of that most essential work. To Erin, Ananya and Stana, I hope I've announced those three names right, uh, who make up the switch team. Uh, Deep, they are, and uh, to Samsung, they are an absolute credit to their families, their schools and this program. I'm the father of two teenage girls. I have a daughter in year 12 who wants to be a midwife next year or study midwifery. She is studying chemistry and biology as well as mathematics. So I know what you girls are going through. Uh, the, pre the quality of the presentation you showed me before and the way that working with technology, you have taken the science angle and the equipment that goes with that and integrated it with that technology and your IT knowledge because you're all studying IT as well. And putting those three together, that's how you get not only the quality of presentation you've just shown me, but the ability and skills that you'll need moving forward. So the one question I didn't ask you three is do you have any idea yet what you want to do after school? We got interrupted by a photographer. <laughs> but can I ask it now? Um, I'm really interested in coding. Encoding, excellent. And then, yeah? Science, something in the science field? Um, astronomy. Astronomy, Stan? Um, I want to be a doctor. You want to be a doctor, okay. Deep, there's why what you're doing with Samsung is so important. 
you know, I have the great honour of walking around my electorate day in and day out and seeing the difference we are making working with our research institutions along with my department across the board because, and I also have the great, uh, great thrill and I see it in these three girls today to know that the next generation, Australia is in a great place and the next generations of its leaders are sitting in our classrooms right now. And to put it very bluntly, which I have a habit of doing because my seat's in Western Sydney and I'm really a publican, not a politician. Um, girls, we need you and all your classmates to continue your studies, succeed, move into careers, pay lots and lots in tax. <laughs> be very, very successful, employ lots of people so they can pay lots and lots in tax. Uh, but most importantly, steward our country in the years to come so that we can all sit back, the elders in this room, and watch you fly. So congratulations to all involved. Again, apologies from Minister Birmingham. He absolutely wanted to be here, but is quite uh, obviously very, very busy. But to all involved, a, a very big congratulations from me. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Our next speaker is Tess Ariotti, Head of Corporate Social Responsibility for Samsung Electronics Australia. And she's going to talk to us about Samsung's support and partnership in this project with Tess. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for all being here today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the owners of the, of the traditional owners of the land which we're gathering and pay my respects to them. Um, I'd also like to thank the Minister. Um, thank you so much for being here today, um, especially jumping in at short notice. Um, and thank you also for your words and considerations. I wholeheartedly support your um, ringing praise of the, the students we have here today. They are indeed um, an asset to their communities and schools and families. And really that's why Samsung works in this space. We've got a strong commitment at Samsung to invest in the communities in which we operate. And um, I think the Minister summed it up beautiful, beautifully about why investing there can help the whole community. Um, I'd also obviously like to acknowledge the University of Canberra, um, the whole team. I don't want to name you because I've worked with so many inspiring people. Um, but thank you so much for such working with Samsung on such a strong and successful collaboration. The result of which really has the potential to support Australian teachers and students now and into the future. And the results really are astonishing and provide a compelling reason to integrate spatial thinking across education and the curriculum. But the results alone aren't what matters. <laughs> Samsung, of course, supported the program before we even knew the results. Uh, and the power of the project lies in a number of factors over and above the results, which Tom and Rob will share with you shortly. The investigation is partly where the strength lies, the inquiry, logic, thoughtful deliberation, and honest assessment of the data puts us in a better place because now we're empowered to act. <coughs> and this mirrors some of the core reasons why we're urging students to seriously consider STEM studies. But being empowered to act doesn't mean that students will want to. And these valuable qualities can be somewhat of a hard sell to students who don't want reason and processes alone. And I think that students uh, often are missing from discussions in STEM. We are often talking about them, but not to them. But what they're telling us is key to understanding the barriers that exist here. So if students say that math and science are difficult and boring, then we need to trust that this is their experience. But it shouldn't be the end of the story. In fact, this project has told a completely different story altogether. The students were highly engaged and took part in the project based in their schools and communities. And in the case of the high school students, they created the content based on their own interests and the world around them. The technology was integral to the success of this project and Samsung and the University of Canberra worked together to understand how to get the most out of this tool, integrating it to enhance educational outcomes <coughs> as well as engagement and interest. Overall, the project did not dismiss the power of engagement, nor did it forget the strength strength of quantifiable results. This project highlights a strong synergy between evidence-based teaching practices and real-world learning and this approach has been highly successful and that in itself is something we can all learn from. But education research doesn't just support classrooms, it has a wider impact. Samsung is committed to working with the Australian community to assist where we are best placed to do so 
and technology is a powerful tool to help individuals and communities. We can see with this research, the benefits in the classroom were immediate, while the conversation about the long-term impact is just beginning, here tonight. <laughs> so we're starting with what we hope will be an ongoing conversation about what the research means and how it can be applied. We'll see from the teacher and student examples that the program has already delivered benefits to the classrooms. And we can all look to the research to learn how best to continue the education relevant to the needs of Australian students today and to the workplaces of the future. So the end product sees the best STEM technology supporting world leading research applied in real world setting. This approach is breaking new ground in outcomes for students. Samsung can see that the landscape of the workplace is changing rapidly and the future will require different skills to the past. And based on these changes, we believe that STEM skills are critical for future success. Samsung will continue to approach all of our community investments through a foundation of evidence-based research and measure the outcomes against relevant objectives. This is an approach that we would encourage across the board and we hope the insights that we're learning about here tonight can help with this. <coughs> Samsung has an ambition to engage young Australians in bold ways, regardless of their socioeconomic or geographic barriers that might exist for them. And with the help of new knowledge and strong partnerships, we can support the change that our communities wish to see. Um, this project has been a key component to the wider community investment work that Samsung makes. Um, and it, it really highlights some of the really practical ways that we can help in the community today. So I'd like to now share with you a short video that captures the essence of what this program is all about. Thank you. During the trial, the students were kept extremely busy. The program was activity after activity. There was also lots of opportunities to address any misconceptions that they may have had around spatial reasoning. The lessons were very flexible. I actually asked the students why they thought spatial reasoning is important, and they came up with some great answers. They said builders, architects, which really surprised me. The main purpose of that project was all the hands-on. I used the same type of technology by making my own nets. I also developed a rule. You can do lots of different things on it. Students had to devise their own projects. Given the information technology students the opportunity to use devices to go and find out about STEM topics and they've been able to do that because we've released the responsibility back to the students. But once we do, that's where the real learning takes place. We're using the Samsung technology to make people see the world through different eyes. At first they have like a different approach to learning. I can see a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't know, like even a blade of grass looks super interesting using the technologies. Director of the STEM Education Research Centre and Centenary Professor at the University of Canberra to provide an overview of the research project and the team's finding at the primary school level. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, if I asked you to um, imagine turning your head to the north, I want you to do that for me, but I don't want you to turn your head to the north, but I want you to imagine that you turn your head to the north. Then I said to you, now when you're facing in that direction, can you tell me if the Senate is on your left hand side or your right hand side? I want you to whisper in someone's ear if you think it's left or right. You've got a 50% chance. <laughs> now, if you didn't know how to do that, and particularly if it was your first time you've been um, in Parliament House, you might have to think about it from another direction and you might have to imagine yourself, for example, coming in at the front and thinking, I can't remember, I had this thing I learned at school, was red on the right or was red on the left? I know that there's red and there's green and I know that we have to go one way or the other. All of those sorts of decisions 
um, are about spatial reasoning. And that's what all, all spatial reasoning is. It's as simple as that. And so um, from, from the perspective And that's spatial reasoning too. So, in other words, you have to be able to press the right hand side and the left hand side in order for the thing to work. It's a very spatial dimension. So, if you didn't know that, you could what's called orientate yourself, and you could actually go and move yourself around in the space and look at it from the other direction, and you would get a different answer. So, instead of your answer being the left, your answer could be the right. And that's what that's what spatial reasoning is all about. And it's that capacity to be able to use your mind and manipulate images in your mind in order to make things work for you. What's interesting about technology is that it is needed more than ever um, in our lives and we have to accept and embrace that technology otherwise we're worried we won't be able, we won't be able to cope with life. It's, it's a really weird thing that we have these days. And, and so this is not just a Western world thing. I mean. In, in developing countries like Indonesia, they are uh, as um, worried about technology as any other country you could imagine, even in some of the most remote areas that we go to. And so, so from that perspective, um, this, the, the sense of being spatial is more needed now than it's ever been. However, technology <coughs> takes away from us our ability to be spatial. So when I was little, one of, the, one of my tasks some of my team will be absolutely amazed by this, was that I had to get the Gregory's out to, in order to follow the map so that when my parents were in Sydney, I could tell them in which direction we had to turn and I had to be able to call the streets out and be able to navigate into a new place by reading a map, okay? Another spatial skill. But these days, children don't need to do that because we have technology-based devices now that actually do a whole lot of that work for us. So on the one hand, that technology is needed more because we have technology, but some of the experiences we have and some of the ways that we've engaged in the past in order to develop these spatial skills are no longer there. So as a result, um, we have this dilemma where technology on the one hand is helping us and on the other hand is not helping us. And so um, from that perspective, um, we need to um, think about how to teach in very different ways. So. What we need to be able to then monitor is the extent to which this work can make sense in a concrete form. And you saw some of the, some of the um, <coughs> notes that Tess showed where the children were still making things. It's really important. But also you saw them working on the, on the, on the tablets and, and, and the um, Google Store apps that were already there that we were able to choose in order to use the tablets meant that the children could do things differently than what they could have if they were only using the concrete materials, by way of example. And what we have done in the past is show that if you train children, and, and, I, and I hate to use the word train normally, because I'm an educator, but if you train children in these particular spatial skills, they will get really good at that quickly. Okay, so the skills are malleable. So you can, you can actually, <coughs> under a very short time get the children to start doing things really, really well. And what's even more bizarre is that even if you have high performing spatial skills, you can still be trained. So we have colleagues at the University of California who work with NASA scientists and astronauts. And you can only imagine how good these astronaut spatial reasoning is. And they're training them to have better spatial reasoning skills. So if we can work for people with NASA, we can certainly work with with me, and, and indeed um, with these wonderful, bright um, adults, uh, young adults that we're actually going to um, listen to today. So that's really important. What has also been interesting is that this, this whole idea about spatial reasoning has been aligned to mathematics for a long time. So if you're good at spatial reasoning, you tend to be good at mathematics. If you're good at mathematics, you tend to be good at spatial reasoning. So there's an association between the two. But very recently, maybe in the last three to four years, we've actually found across the world that the best um, predictor of being good at STEM, and more importantly, going into a STEM profession, is having high spatial reasoning skills. So in the US, millions and millions and millions of dollars have been spent on trying to encourage girls to move into STEM. Okay? And, they're, and they've been encouraging them from grade 10, grade 10, grade 11, and grade 12. And they found that many, many of the initiatives they were doing weren't working. 
and they started to worry about why this was happening. So they decided what we needed to do was um, think differently and find out wh what the people are like who are already in the profession and find out what characteristics they have. And the one thing that came up as the biggest predictor was spatial reasoning skills. So that's why we became interested in it. And there's been people all over the world who have actually shown that with training, it will improve your spatial skills. And then they've measured these people's mathematics skills and they have a good correlation. If it's high, they're good at maths. If it's low, they tend not to be good at maths. And they've also seen that this, this connection happened um, from being um, in the profession. What no one has known is whether or not if you improve the spatial reasoning skills, does your mathematics skill improve? So we did a study over a 10 week period um, in, in the um, ACT um, with the DET and with the Archdiocese to see whether or not if we stop using mathematics, go figure, stop using some of the mathematics and got the children to do the spatial training instead, would the mathematics go up? The answer, it did. So, um, and we were able to publish that study and we're the first group in the world to prove under um, strict experimental conditions that if you um, train spatially, your mathematics will improve. Then Samsung came along and what they said to us was, um, can you um, work in some areas of, of uh, disadvantage and can you work in some areas of advantage and um, work with us to see whether or not the technology will actually enhance that. So what we had to do was not do our 10 week training program, which we had already proven was highly successful and has just been published in the British Journal of Educational Psychology. What we said, we were quite brave and said, instead of doing it for 10 weeks, we'll only do it for three weeks. Instead of the, instead of the strict course that we wanted the teachers to do having 20 hours, it had six hours. But what we did instead was we got, um, thanks to Samsung, tablets, and we um, got those into the classrooms. We invited the teachers to come out and just do one day with us. In our first program, the teachers came and, and, and we're at UC for five days, where we, where we actually encouraged the teachers and we actually got them involved in the program. The brilliant teachers this time had about 24 hours with us. And much of that time, they, well, they were sleeping or not having to put up with us. So <laughs> we're talking about a very short period of time. And they went back into their classrooms under all different sorts of situations and undertook, undertook this program with six hours only. The difference was they had the tablets and they had uh, purposefully selected apps that we had chosen from the Google store to use and to enhance the program. So what happened? We had uh, control groups and experimental groups because you have to do that in a, in a proper empirical design and the, the children's spatial reasoning improved by about 12% over a three week period. That, and, and we were only doing a uh, one small part of a spatial reasoning um, program, and it's called spatial visualisation. They improved. The mathematics score went up 20%. The effect size was between 0.5 and 0.6, which some people say is one year of learning. Six hours. Mm. One year of learning. It's very scary. So, so from that perspective, um, the, the, the program that we developed was modified, the teachers that we had to undertake the program with us were brilliant. They knew what they were doing and they had high um, capacity and, the, and their pedagogical knowledge was fantastic. Some admitted, admitted to us their spatial reasoning wasn't great. And they, I think they've got good spatial reasoning now. <laughs> because cause one good thing about being a teacher is as you teach you get better at it yourself. And so they, they have um, moved into, that, into a really powerful way with us and the results we are actually um, blown away by and we had to check and recheck and recheck all of our analysis before I was game enough to ring tests and say you're not going to believe these results. So that's what that's what we found and now we've got this um, exciting period to think about what to do next now based on this work. So here are just some um, photos um, and, and what I have there are some of the voices from the teachers and some of the voices from the children because importantly the children were having fun and the teachers were engaged and, and that's just as important as anything else. So, so sure, test scores are really important. Sure, to have confidence is important, but to have that affect of, about enjoying what you're doing and wanting to be engaged and going and practicing these things yourself is the, is the thing that we should be really um, challenging the children to do and, and 
that, because that's the thing that will sustain them into the future. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, what it means is that this spatial, this spatial reasoning is really important. So if you're a parent, you have to go and buy Lego. That's what you have to do. Because if you're, if you're using Lego when you're four years of age, you're more likely to become an engineer than any other predictor with, that, that, that um, scientists have been able to work out. Incredible. That's, and it's important that you're still climbing trees. It's important that you're still navigating. It's important that you switch off your mobile device that tells you how to get from here to Sydney and try and work it out for yourself. Even if it means an argument in the car, it's all <laughs> worth it. Because these spatial skills um, can be developed and they can be um, engaged and trained if you, if you are prepared to do it and work hard at it. And that's the good news. And for policymakers, what we are really trying to say is trust us because um, we can do it. And um, with, the, with, as um, the Vice Chancellor mentioned, with the Department of Education, um, we've been um, awarded the opportunity to um, work with four-year-olds um, in the ELSA project, which, which is to look at STEM learning um, across Australia. And uh, the Minister soon will be talking about <coughs> 100 pilot schools that are going to be engaged in our program and one of the key features of, of the work that we're doing working with these four-year-olds is on spatial reasoning because it, it has to start that early. Now of course the, the children we're going to hear about here have improved their spatial skills and they weren't four and of course the NASA scientists can improve their spatial skills but the earlier we start the more likely that um, into the future we'll be setting people up to come and work at SAMHSA. Thank you very much. If I could now ask Professor Rob Fitzgerald from the University of Canberra to take us through the team's findings at the high school level. Thank you. Uh, so, good afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the secondary component of the Samsung project. And our approach builds on the work that Tom and his team were doing in the primary uh, to adopt a technology enhanced active learning approach around fundamentally thinking about how do we develop inquiry approaches in, in STEM. So we used Samsung phones, um, Samsung Gear VR headsets that you saw in, in that short video clip, and the 360 cameras as some of our building blocks. Some of you may or may not know that the modern smartphone is rich in sensors, accelerometers, barometers, compasses, GPSs, uh, gyroscopes, all of which can be used and deployed for doing real science. I'll talk a little bit about that and you'll see some of this work a little bit later as well. But I want to sort of um, mention two things about our approach, technology enhanced active learning. Research tells us that students learn STEM more effectively when they're actively engaged in, in these active learning approaches. Further, technology used well and wisely can enhance, amplify and extend that. Now, you may have heard that sometimes phones in the schools aren't always a good thing, if not even a distraction. Not in this approach. We found a way of drilling down to the potential of the technology to actually use that to engage the students. The work that Graham did with St. Francis Xavier, launching a Samsung phone in a rocket, um, looking at that data that came out of that is something that I think is going to be used over and over again. I also want to talk a little bit about innovation and design because they were key features of, of the work that both schools were engaged in. We hear a lot about innovation and certainly it's important, but so is imagination and creativity. So Ken Robinson has said before that innovation is applied creativity and creativity is applied imagination. I like to say that creativity and imagination fuel innovation. I think we need to have a, a little bit more of a conversation about that imagination creativity. This is exactly what these teachers did in these two schools. They gave the students the license to be imaginative, to be creative, to use the technology in deep and engaging ways. And I think what they've come up with, I think is, is, is quite impressive. And for me, these are the true 21st century skills. Design the problem, not just solve the problem, but design it. Develop empathy, think about others as you were doing this, and the, the work that the students from St. Clair's did around <coughs> this virtual reality tour of Tidbin Villa was fundamentally about understanding who's the audience for this. And I think we sometimes forget that when we talk about STEM, that empathy is an important part of this process. So what do we do? 
So I've mentioned very briefly, we had St. Clair's College and St. Francis Xavier College develop STEM inquiry projects. They use the phones as data loggers, they use the phones to tell stories about what they did. The great support we had from the schools and the teachers, Juliet, Graham, Jerry, and these amazing students. Um, uh, this work didn't just happen in the classroom, it happened at lunch times, in recess, on the weekends. And I think the commitment and dedication of those teachers is something to really be applauded. You will see some of this work tonight, from year seven through to year 12, to that amazing rocket launch. But for me, when we come to think about what we've learnt, um, a couple of key things come to, to mind. Firstly, that real data is really interesting, and it's something that we need to draw more on in our work we do in STEM. With the mobile technology, it helped these students go out into the field to conduct real, in the wild investigations, and that helped engage them too. It also let us collect data that where we could speed it up, slow it down, actually engage in the pedagogy of what was going on. We saw an increase in design process thinking skills and inquiry-based approaches. The teachers noted the change in the way that they taught in terms of giving students a license to be creative. And finally, when you get a chance to talk to these students, and we've already heard tonight, you'll see how they took responsibility for this, their STEM learning. That's probably enough for me. I'd, I'd love to introduce now Erin Burke, uh, one of the students, Year 9 students at St Clair's, to talk a little bit about the work that they did. Erin? Good afternoon, Minister, Professor Fitzgerald and Professor Lowry, and invited guests. My name is Erin Burke and I'm a Year 9 student of St. Clair's College, where I'm a part of a group called SWITCH, which is an unfunded extracurricular program run at lunchtimes. SWITCH stands for St. Clair's Women in Information Technology and Communications Hub. As part of this group, throughout the year, we take part in various projects and competitions. Around 10 weeks ago, I began working with a group of other students on the Samsung project. I've been in Switch for just under three years and this project was one of, if not the coolest project yet. There were many factors that made this such a great learning opportunity for me, quite a substantial proportion of which were centered around the amazing technology that Samsung generously loaned to us. St. Clair's would not have been able to afford to participate in this event without the support of Samsung and University of Canberra. The technology, especially phones and VR headsets, was so much fun to learn with and play with and it I immensely enjoyed the opportunity that this type of challenge gave to me. In a general schooling demographic, we are given an item and told to learn a specific thing using this specific item. When we were invited to find a way to learn something, anything, using an item of Samsung technology, my outlook suddenly seemed a lot wider. At school I went from thinking I'm supposed to be learning about science or maths to thinking that I'm supposed to be learning about anything I can. For my group's project, we used the three the phones and the 360 camera to bring something we love to someone else. And we did this by combining our knowledge of STEM subjects. We wanted to show the world how great our Canberra is. We used the Samsung technology to capture different ecosystems around Tidbinbilla. We took a video where the phones were underwater and we could clearly see the plants, rocks and fish. We also recorded our experience as we did multiple walks and captured all of them on the 360 camera. At one point, we looked at the population density of trees using spatial and mathematical concepts of quadrants. This is something that I wouldn't have expected to learn or use from an IT-based project. We then put them into a virtual reality video with help from a Samsung representative. Another group used the phones and microscopes to capture different environments and surfaces from different aspects. They hope to teach people to view the world from different ways. There was also a group whose idea came from, from career opportunities when they realised that there wasn't really any way to learn about what comes next after Year 12 using IT. They created a virtual reality video of different options after leaving school or university. They took videos with the 360 camera and phones of Mitsubishi Mechanics in Belconnen, University of Canberra and Canberra Helicopters. The sample the Samsung project helped us all develop many skills. Spatial reasoning is a skill that we had previously taken for granted in the world around us. Drawing from our knowledge of the Samsung project has allowed our students to look at inner space within our environment, whether it be the surface of the water and what lies beneath it, or how we move through our physical environment using the motion of physics and biology of human movement. 
Another skill that this project helped me enhance was my ability to plan, create and learn using the design process. And because I was in a group where everyone had a variety of different skill sets, I was able to learn from them as well. After finishing, I believe that this would be an amazing way to complement the Australian STEM curriculum in every school, to challenge students to find their own way to learn and teach. Finally, on behalf of St. Clair's College, I'd like to thank everyone involved in this project, especially Professor Fitzgerald and Samsung, for giving us this opportunity. Thanks, Erin, and thanks, uh, Rob. And uh, lastly, I'd like to invite up Miss Deborah Heath um, from St. Joseph's Primary School to discuss her involvement in the project together with Tess from Samsung. ago now and then there was some discussion on it then and I you know, thought oh wow this sounds really interesting so I spoke to him then and you know education research is fantastic and it needs to happen in the classroom you know um, so that's why I was really uh, wanting to come on board because it was classroom based observing the kids at, at their level. Yep. Great and so um, yes in the classroom was a key part of interest for Samsung here as well. Mm. But what happened differently in the classroom to something that would typically happen in your classroom when you were doing this project? I think the le my pedagogical level certainly um, was improved uh, and also uh, using inquiry questions a lot more with the students and getting them to communicate their understandings and learnings of, along the journey. Yeah. yeah, cool. And so you said your pedagogy shifted, um, but how? Can you elaborate a bit more on how this program has altered or shifted um, ways that you've taught the students or engaged with the students? Sure, um, and again, inquiry questions are not just one inquiry a day, it's, it, it's sometimes it was 10. So you're communicating with the students continuously and getting them to communicate back to you what they are learning. Um, they were kept very busy, it was um, paper based, it was using the Samsung devices, it was and then there was an opportunity for one student who came to me and he said, I think I've got something, I think I want to take this further. And, you know, so it broadened education and allowed those kids to, to take off. Do you remember what he had? Do you remember what it was? Yes, it was, a, it was a cube net and he developed his idea or his hypothesis that if a cube had a cube net had three squares in the middle and had to be a certain height. So with the use of the device, he was able to test and test and test and he kept coming back, yes, I think I'm right, yes, I think I'm right. Then after we sent all the results back, he came to me and said, I'm not right, I'm wrong. I found a one that didn't work and I said, that's great learning. That's fantastic. Learning. Yes, yes, so it was really quite nice. Great. And so that was one great example of how your students are responding. Is there sort of, does that, is that representative of how en masse your students responded to the program? Yes, they, they used to say to me, when are we doing maths? <laughs> when are we, you know, are we doing maths today? You know, when are we doing And so that so, was a change. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big change, yes. Okay. Um, and so I guess we're here tonight to, um, you've, you've been a part of the program and experienced it, but we're here tonight to start to share the experiences and the results with the wider education community. So if there was something that you took away from this, um, being a part of this project that you'd really like to share with other teachers, what would that Most be? Most certainly. And when I spent those few hours with Tom and Tracy and Helen, when we came down from it for our training days, Tom introduced me to a framework that he developed, um, ELPSA. Absolutely love it. I use it, still use it, we're trying to put it into, we're going to put it into our own agreed practice of mathematics 
I've used it in science, I've used it in geography. So teachers out there, grab hold of it, have a read of Tom's paper, it's fantastic. And I'd also like to add that using technology so that it just gives the kids another opportunity to um, test, you know, check. Prototype rapidly. Yes. <laughs> yes. I learned that one from our friends across yeah. the world today. <laughs> Great. And so is there any um, like concluding thoughts or final remarks that you have? Oh, about look, I'm you? just, the data, the, the results are just amazing. And throughout the project, I knew these kids were getting better because of the way they were communicating their learning with me. So to see it in black and white up on the screen, I just went, Oh my goodness, that's wonderful. I think we all so, <laughs> keep me in mind, please, University Samsung. I'd love to be on board for your next project. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah and Tess. So, that now concludes the formal part of the afternoon. Um, we invited you here today because, as you can see from what's been discussed and presented, the results of the project are exciting and that they show us that if we bridge the gap between academic research and classroom practice, we can achieve strong outcomes for our children. STEM practices like those embodied within spatial reasoning are independent of content and so can be incorporated in many ways across every subject. Going back to my son's observation this morning, the best drivers today are certainly those that are highly spatially aware. That's what Tom said. <laughs> There is a very strong probability, however, that the best drivers of the future will be those that put their well-developed spatial awareness skills to work in a different way, designing and developing the machines and complex programs that will automatically take us places or do things for us, ironically enough, rendering us less spatially aware in the process. Interesting times ahead. We now invite you to experience uh, the project for yourself at the back of the room uh, with the tablets. Um, and on behalf of Samsung and the University of Canberra, I'd like to thank you for coming this afternoon and good evening.